Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see everyone here this morning for my first uh, leading of worship with you wonderful people. I just want to say before we get too far into this, if I look nervous, I want to assure you that I am petrified. <laughs> Go ahead and throw that out there. Um, glad you're here with us this morning. Glad to have you here. I hope that you will fill out the uh, tear-off section of your bulletin. Please include all the information you feel comfortable in sharing. Um, any prayer requests, please include those. It would be our honor to, to pray for you, uh, for your request and for your, your needs in that. Man, let us pray. God, we thank you for this chance just to come and gather in this your house to praise and to pray and to grow. We pray that as this service goes on, Lord, that it will move us closer to your throne, but that ultimately it will be and bring all glory and honor to you. Lord, we give you thanks for this great day, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. one through nine and 18 through 23. Hear these words. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on, fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. 
Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is a seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. And if the youth would come forward at this time. Children, excuse me, children. Now, Miss Jessica just read us some scripture, and who knows what she read about? One of you know what she read about? What'd she read about? Seeds. Oh, she told you? Well, that's good. It's okay to get help every once in a while. I saw some of y'all walking in this morning. Y'all had some flower pots in your hands. Did y'all plant some seeds this morning? They didn't really work. Well, you got to give them time because seeds take time. You got to water them and you got to care for them. Jesus was using the example of seeds talking about God's word. Have you ever heard the, uh, God's word referred to as seeds? And what he was saying was that we have to plant God's word into good soil. But that don't mean we're supposed to go out and bury our Bible in the dirt. 
That means we hear God's word and we, and we take it into our heart. And by doing so, we begin to become more like God. And in becoming like God, we begin to love people. We begin to love those who God loves. And who does God love? Us. How about everybody? Okay, everybody. You, you, you accept that answer? Good. God loves everybody. And when we, when we allow his word to enter into our heart, we begin to become like God and we begin to love everybody. Man, let us pray. God, we thank you for this time and for these wonderful children as they come and with such promise and, and hope for the future. Lord, we give you thanks for them and ask that you would just allow your word to take root in their heart, that you would allow them to continue to grow and become the, the, the people that you would have them to be. And God, we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. If we can invite those students that are going to be involved in pump camp um, this week to come forward. Yeah, I know we have one here this morning. Pump camp is a ministry of the Paducah District, and it was actually started by Gregory Waldrip, which some of you, I know, know who Gregory is. And what pump camp is, it's a week-long mission camp that takes place in and around Paducah where we work with ministries like Starfish Orphan Ministry, Paducah Cooperative Ministry, the Community Kitchen Ministry, um, Kids Against Hunger, several other places around Paducah. And we do mission work. And this week we have four students um, from Graves County that are connected to our congregation as well as Trinity. We have Benjamin Phillips, Kyler Mason, Madison Kite, and Luke Keeling. So this morning we want to um, commission Benjamin and his fellow youth for the work that they'll be doing next week and we also want to pray for them as they go out into the mission field to do work for the Lord's kingdom. All who take upon themselves the name of Christ are called into ministries of love and service by the example of Christ. As these members of our community begin their work through the mission of Pump Camp, we pray the blessings of God and this community upon their endeavors. We recognize Benjamin, as well as the other ambassadors of this congregation in ministry with Pump Camp, and we dedicate him and them to the service in the name of Jesus Christ. Our prayers will be united with you in your work, and may God richly bless you in your labors. We affirm our belief in the responsibilities of Christian service. We believe in God, creator of the world, and in Jesus Christ, the redeemer of creation. We believe in the Holy Spirit, through whom we acknowledge God's gifts. We commit ourselves to the rights and dignity of all persons and to the improvement of the quality of life. And we dedicate you and ourselves to peace throughout the world and to rule, justice, and law among all the nations. We believe in the present and final triumph of God's word in human affairs and gladly accept your commission to manifest the life of the gospel in the world. Um, as we're fixing to pray for Benjamin and for Kyler and for Madison, we do ask that if you would, where you are, if you would just stand. And if you would feel so led, just extend your hand towards, towards them and just join us in this prayer for these, these missionaries that will be before us this week. And as we're specifically praying over our missionaries, we're also going to be lifting up the prayer for the other 85 that will be joining us in this coming week. So let us pray. Father God, we give you thanks for, for Benjamin and for, for Kyler and for Madison and for all those who have heard the call to service and willingly accept that call. As we go forth into this week of, of painting homes and feeding the hungry, Lord, loving those that you love. Lord, we ask that you would just show yourself to us in ways that we have never before seen. We pray strength for 
these youth and the youth that will be coming from all across the, the region to join in this mission uh, to relieve the suffering of those who are less fortunate than us. God, we give you thanks for this calling and for this place to serve and for these wonderful folks who have heard the call and have said yes. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And let us pray. Oh Lord God, you have shown your love for us through the giving of these, your gifts. We ask, Lord, that as we come now to give back a portion of these gifts, that you would partake of these gifts, that you would accept our first fruits, Lord, and not the crumbs from our table. And that in the giving of these gifts, Lord, we would show our love for you, our love for this, your church, and our love for the community that surrounds us. And Lord, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Told you, I'm lost this morning. Now we have our scripture this morning from the Old Testament coming from the book of Genesis, chapter 25, starting at verse 19. This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel of Aramean, from Padan Aram, and sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her and she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the other will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was, hair, was like a hairy garment, and so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew, I am famished. This is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I am going to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
had to follow that this morning at Trinity, and it's not any easier at Mayfield first. <laughs> I hate to be the bearer of bad news to you this morning, but I just read a story that some of you may have experienced once or twice in your life, but apparently siblings don't get along. <laughs> apparently twin siblings get along even less than siblings in general. We read this morning of the story of Jacob and Esau and, and how, how Esau sold his birthright. Now I'm going to attempt to pronounce this word right. I, I'm hoping that Google has not failed me in this endeavor. But the birthright, we call that today male promogenture. Promogenture is how that's pronounced. And that is the right of the eldest son to receive the inheritance. In my case, if that had still been the, the, the standard of the day, then I would not have received the inheritance had my brother outlived my mother. Uh, me being the second youngest, I would have not received that. So I would have been in the role of Jacob. But Jacob was cunning. Jacob was loved by his mother. Esau more favored by his father as was the, the, the rule of the day. And so upon his brother coming home from a particularly bad day of hunting, and if there are hunters in the, in the audience today, you know that not always is it possible to come home with something from a day of hunting. Sometimes the deer don't step where you want it to, or the turkey doesn't get close enough, or something spooks that animal, and they just, it just doesn't always work out in your favor. Esau had had one of those days, and so he, he'd come home, and he was just starving. And so, so Jacob took this as an opportunity to receive what he had wanted, the birthright. Now, have any, was, any of us in here, and I know that uh, I, I don't really want you to raise your hand, but I'll raise my hand because I know I've done it, but I have made a snap decision that didn't work out in my favor. I probably made some today that didn't work out in my favor, and the day is still pretty new. Esau, in a snap decision, led by the grumblings and the hunger pain, pangs in his stomach, said, I'm about to die. What good is the birthright? Take it. And he enjoyed some of Jacob's stew. I hope it was good stew because it cost a lot. Esau having been born first, receiving the birthright, was positioned in his family for a bright future ahead of him, for a successful future. And he gave that away in a moment's notice. Now we have some wonderful illustrations of that, one that came to mind that some of us in here may, may remember quite well is the Coca-Cola Corporation. Coca-Cola was founded in 1886 by a pharmacist and it was created as a patent medicine. Now I had to look that up to figure out what that was and for those of you who don't know, I will enlighten you so we can be together in this. A patent medicine was something that they had in the, in, in the Old West days in the late 1800s that was claimed to be a, a miracle cure that really didn't cure anything. Kind of like you see in the westerns, the, the, the medicine man with his snake oil. Coke was supposed to be this huge, just miracle drug that really all it done was cause you to get fat. But a businessman saw this as an idea to make some money. And so he bought the rights to, to Coke, he bought it, and he began marketing, as, marketing it as a refreshing drink. Now this businessman was an, a very uh, a, an astute advertiser. And if you're a fan of the show Pawn Stars, you'll know what I mean because it's quite often that on that show someone comes in attempting to sell some antique Coke paraphernalia. Because in the early 1900s, Coke stamped their logo on everything. Thermometers, signs, anything you could think of. You'd see the familiar red and white Coke logo. 
Well, let's fast forward uh, almost 100 years to 1985. A new day has dawned. Coke is no longer the number one product in America, the number one soft drink in America. Pepsi has overtaken them. They have lost shares of the market. They're not happy about this. They have hired a new CEO, and his words were, we will not have any golden idols in the Coca-Cola Corporation, including our original recipe. And so they changed the formula. Does anyone in here remember New Coke? Does anyone want to take a stab as to how long New Coke was on the market before the public outcry was enough that they brought back the original recipe? 77 days. Much like Jacob and Esau, Coke had in a split second the thought, you know, we're failing in the market, we're not where we used to be, so let's just throw away our history and change what we've always done. And analysts are just divided on whether it worked or not for those 77 days. Apparently it didn't or it would have lasted longer. Some have even went as far as to say that it was a marketing ploy. So when they brought back the original recipe, it would spike the sales, which it did. Um, they assure us that it was not. But they gave up their past for a future that they, wasn't, that, that they were hoping to claim. I remember when I was a, a little bitty tyke, and I wasn't very little long. Tammy can attest to that. Mom and my sister, Nancy, used to own a pest control business, and they had one of those, those cool old Coke machines, you know, where you put the quarter in and pull the bottle out. And who remembers what the bottles were made of? Glass. As a little guy, I would, I would be playing in the yard, and I'd see the Coke truck pull up, and I knew my buddy was coming. And I would run up to him and I'd ask for an Ely Ely Elio, which was little bitty kid speak for a mellow yellow. And it got it got so so much it got to the point where he knew it was coming. So when he would go to start loading his truck, he would put one in his back pocket. And so when I asked, he would just pull it out and hand it to me. Now I don't remember asking for the for the mellow yellow. I don't remember calling it an Ely Ely Elio, but I do remember one distinctive thing about the mellow yellow. That green colored glass that it was in and the shape of the bottle. It had those familiar indentions in the bottle. If we was to go to the store right now and buy a mellow yellow, it would still be in that distinctive green colored bottle with those indentions in it. It would just be made out of a different material. Early on, after they began to market it as a drink and not a medicine, Coke decided they needed to make their packaging distinctive, their thought was that it would be so distinctive that even in the dark, someone could tell that they were ha drinking a Coke. So much so that if they saw a bottle broken on the road, they could tell by the shape of the broken shards that it was a Coke bottle that was broken. Fast forward to 2014, we can go to the store, we can buy a 20 ounce Coke, we can buy a one liter Coke, two liter Coke, and set them all next to each other, and the bottles all are shaped the same. Coke calls this their contour bottle, and they are protecting their past by keeping that distinctive shape that everyone's so familiar with, but they're also claiming their future because they have changed the materials so that it is now plastic, so there's no danger of it breaking, and I'm sure it's also quite a bit cheaper on them to use plastic as opposed to glass. I'm sure some of us in here may have made a little money in our, in our younger days by picking up Coke bottles and returning them for the deposit. Jacob didn't protect, excuse me, Esau didn't protect his past. In, the, in a whim, in a moment of, 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 of quick decision, he gave his past away. He thought, I'm not going to survive, just take my past, take my birthright, just give me some soup, I'm really hungry. Coke didn't protect their past, they thought, well, well, we'll come up with this new idea. They ventured away from their past for the, for the moment, just because sales wasn't where they wanted them to be. 
and 77 days later had to go crawling back to their past. And now, because of their marketing, because of the ori- using the original formula that was formulated in 1886, chances are if you go to a restaurant today, you order a Coke, regardless of whether it, you, you actually get a Pepsi or an RC or I do, I say, I'll have Coke to drink, and then the waitress usually tell me, well, we have Pepsi, okay. I don't drink sodas, I drink Coke. As the church, as the church, and we've talked about this a lot during this series, the church has a past. I look forward to, in the days and years ahead, as I serve alongside of you, learning the history of Mayfield First United Methodist Church. I have heard a little bit of it. I do understand that that this building that we're in was built in 1919. But I believe I'm also standing on a point where Mayfield First United Methodist Church is protecting the past and claiming their future because in a few short months we're going to have a brand new pulpit that's going to look an awful lot like the one we had only it's going to be a lot more functional a lot more useful for worship and for programs that that we enjoy hosting a couple of weeks ago as I spoke to Trinity The Trinity folks, I reminded them that not only does our church have a past, but also we have a past. And that past is what makes us who we are. I told you at the start of the service that I was petrified standing up here. Had this been about 10 years ago, I wouldn't be standing here. If you remember on that first Sunday, Jessica shared with you that for a a, a few years of my younger days, I was a professional wrestler. When I tell my call to ministry story, professional wrestling is the point in which I broke out of my shell and God said, now, now I can begin to use you for my purpose. Because before then, believe it or not, I was painfully shy. So shy that if I'd had my, my, my option, I'd have been either in the back corner, or I'd been up in the back corner of the balcony, where very few people could see me. Each of us has a past that we should protect, we should we should protect that past much like Esau should have protected his birthright. The good and the bad, the pluses and the minuses because it has brought us to this day and has made us who we are. Through a little help, or not a little, but a lot of help from God. And it is that past that is going to allow us to claim our future. In the coming weeks, I'm sure we'll hear more of this story of Jacob and Esau, and we'll see how Esau gave up his birthright, and so Jacob claimed the future that very well could have been Esau's. You probably noticed that instead of an outline to fill in in your GPS, there's just some sermon notes. I wanted you to have the freedom to be able to just, just, just jot down whatever God just really laid on your heart as I was speaking. But I do want to remind us of one of those statements, that statement that, that, that every time I've heard Job mention it just really resonates in, in my mind. And that is our past is preparing us, or excuse me, our past is allowing us to stand upon the shoulders of those who came before us. And it's preparing us for the generations that are in, that are here and for the generations that are coming behind us. I 
And I guess that statement resonates with me because in 2007 I got the chance to take a trip to England and, and experience some of the Wesleyan heritage sites. I got to go and stand on the shoulders of the giants of Methodism, of Wesley and, and, and Francis Asbury and those guys that we read about in, in the history books and we learn about in our, our, our Wesleyan heritage classes. Those guys that me and Jessica have just heard a whole lot about in seminary. But I'm reminded of that statement because I come home, I wanted to save some of the, the money that I, I, I got while I was in England and I brought home, it's in the, the Altoids can, you know, the Altoids mints. I have a can that's just got just a handful of change in it. But I made sure that I had each one, at least one of each coin in there and the two pound coin has stamped on the edge, standing on the shoulders of giants. When we're protecting our past, we are standing on the shoulders of those who come before us, just like they stood on the shoulders who, of those who come before them. And when you're standing on the shoulders of those saints, it allows us to see the future. It allows us to prepare for the generations that are here, that's us. To love the generations that are here, to serve the generations that are in our very presence. And then just like the pulpit reconstruction prepare for the generations that are coming behind us. I'm sure, even though I wasn't in on those meetings, there was a lot of prayer and thought put into not only the design of the pulpit, but the generations that would use it after us. For the lives that would be saved by meeting Jesus, knelt down on what will, when our kneeling pads come back. for the chances to commune with God as we take communion around the pulpit. For the ministers that'll come long after Joe and I have gone on to our great reward. The messages they will preach to those who will listen. And they'll do that by standing on our shoulders. Those lives will be changed by standing on our shoulders just as we have stood on the shoulders of those who come before us by protecting our past, but not living in the past, remembering the past living in the here and now, but not staying in the here and now, but looking to our future. Esau didn't protect his past. He didn't look to his future. He was in the here and the now. His, his stomach was grumbling, maybe like some of ours are right now, thinking, preacher, shut up, it's time to go eat. As our bellies are rumbling, Esau's was rumbling, he was hungry. He couldn't think about the future, he couldn't think about the past, he could, all he could think about was the smell of the stew. I took a public speaking course one time and we was talking about, the professor mentioned something and I, about talking and, and, and speaking and, and, and in church services and, and the ladies in the basement cooking. I said, there's been a lot of good sermons killed by a lot of good meals being cooked in the basement. The smell of the stew was drawing Esau in. And, and, and you know when you're hungry, it, it, it may not taste real good, but it smells real good. And the more hungry you are, the better it smells. And so it was drawing Esau in. And in that split second, in that living, in that moment, he didn't look to the past. He didn't look to the future. He didn't protect his past. He didn't claim his future. He stopped and said, take it, 
for a bowl of soup. Friends, we have a storied past, both as a church and as an individual. We have a, 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 a vibrant moment to live in now. God has called us to live in this moment. And we have a bright future to claim. God is calling us to look to the future and to claim that future. To use this moment to claim the future. And in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.